Hello, and welcome to Sundays at Coastal. This week, Pastor Andy Rock continues our series in Ephesians with a sermon titled, How Hope United Us. I've surrendered control to Jesus. Our shared faith involves the ongoing choice to trust Him. Embracing this faith brings joy, belonging, hope, and love as we witness God's miracles. Despite challenges and the brokenness of our world, our baptism symbolizes a transformation from death to life. Hope doesn't mean avoiding difficulties, but with Jesus, it means redemption amid pain. Together, we demonstrate the reality of hope by choosing unity in the Spirit, even amidst our struggles. Hi, friends. Oh, I'm so happy this morning. I got to hold a baby. Um... We are here. We're so grateful for you. So, so grateful for you. For all those who are watching online, we love you so much. A special shout out this morning to Mark and Faye McNeil. Mark's in the hospital. Can we pray for Mark real quick? Would that be okay? Jesus, we pray for Mark that you would give his body life, that this uh, MRSA infection would be completely healed. Bless Faye as she cares for her amazing husband. And Lord, we just ask for complete healing for him. So we love you, Faye and Mark. Mwah, mwah. Amen. Amen? So we believe three things as a church. This comes from Isaiah 61, that there's always hope beyond our brokenness, always. We all have a story, um, and none of us are perfect in this church. If you are, let me know. We'll write a book, and we'll make a billion dollars. It'll be amazing. <laughs> Um, If you're pretending that you are, uh, good luck. And uh, so there is always hope beyond our brokenness, always. The story of being a Christian is God healing us, transforming us. And people from the outside look at us and go, wow, uh, I guess people do change because this person's different. But on the inside, it feels like, man, I'm just working on that next thing with the Holy Spirit. because But when we look back on our lives, we can see that God has taken us from death to life. There's always hope beyond our brokenness. You're walking in here this morning and you're wondering, can God change this person I love? Can God change me? Can God make a difference in this situation? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Second, we are called to trust, and we believe that we're called to trust in our risen Savior. Jesus is alive. We don't believe in the force, right? Right? We believe in Jesus. He's got a name. Oh, calm down, Brianna. Uh, And uh, Star Wars junkie, sorry. Uh, And so we believe in Jesus, right? He is alive. He's risen. He's not an idea. He's not a set of principles, Right? Uh, We believe in Jesus, and he is alive, present by his spirit in our midst. And we are called to trust him with every area of our life, and that takes time, and we learn how to do that together. Ain't nobody's born knowing exactly how to trust Jesus all the way with everything instantly. Yeah? Yeah? And sometimes God heals us, boom, like that. And we don't struggle anymore with that issue. And sometimes we've got to get in the nitty-gritty of how that healing works. And 99% of the time, it's because you're supposed to be a help to the next person that needs to get healed. But we get to do this thing called faith together. And so we don't perform through it. We stumble and fall down through it. You hear all about that this morning from me. Uh, And the reason why that's so important is because faith doesn't look like uh, pretending that everything's great all the time. Faith looks like getting into and through the difficulty, the funk, the glory, the beauty, the heartache, the joy, all of the expanse of this life that we have together. Lastly, we're called to bring restoration to our community and to our world. And you're doing that through Change for a Dollar. We're doing that by helping our brothers and sisters uh, that are part of Divino Salvador and part of the migrant farm community here. We do that through helping kids who are molting, right? And junior hires and high schoolers. 
And kids that are never going to show up to church, we do that by, through Young Life. We support Young Life, and we're working on planting Young Life again in Arroyo Grande. Um, we do that through all kinds. I mean, the list goes on of the ways that we make a difference in our community. Uh, and what's so remarkable about you, last year I said we were on pace, our little church, to give away uh, $200,000 to people that were in need, Right? This is not us spending money on stuff or salaries or whatever like that. I lied. You're going to give more than that this year. I think last week it was the total was $175,000. And there's still two more months to go. I'm just so grateful for you. So, so grateful for you. And every day, as followers of Jesus, we make a choice. We make a choice. And so today, what we do, and this is every Sunday, we say this together. We choose this together. And so if you'd like to follow Jesus today, if you want the Holy Spirit to move in your heart today, if you want to have God be at the center of your life and lead the way, then choose this with me. Today, I choose to be changed by Jesus. I choose to seek Jesus first, and I choose to join Jesus in his resurrection work. Oh, man. So last week, Kurt preached an epic message helping us see that living a life worthy of our calling is about those redemption moments and stories that we have in our life. It's leaning into our own redemption so that then we can be a part of another's, right? Right? It's not uh, leaning into our moral self-improvement by ourselves and our self-righteousness and pretending everything's okay. It's leaning into, God, I need you in the, middle of my, in the middle of this thing. Help me. And then learning how to, then, or choosing to be with somebody else as, as you do that. And so Kurt preached an amazing message this morning. This morning, I'm going to preach three verses. Three. We'll be done in 11 minutes. Um, it's not true. We'll be here till noon. Um, why am I preaching three verses? I want to help you, when you read Scripture, slow down just a little bit. Because oftentimes when I read Scripture and I don't understand it, I go, da 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 let me get to something I know or figure, can figure out. And if you slow down just a moment and put yourself in the story just for a moment, you'll see the weight of the words that are, that are being spoken here. Remember that in order to make one sheet of paper, they had to take papyrus, beat it out by, uh, uh, smash it out with a rock, weave it together into a pulp, hang it on stuff, and that cost, right, to write a letter, that cost about $1,000, So how much does each one of these words weigh? They're not just haphazard. It's not just, well, I can, it's a word document, so whatever, you know. It's every word matters. And so there's really something important for you today. I know it. I know it. So would you pray with me? And can I have permission to speak to your heart of hearts? Yes. Would that be okay? So Holy Spirit, come. <sighs> Fill this place with your presence. We re renew our armor, Jesus. We bind up in silence everything opposed to Christ that's trying to distract us or put us to sleep or to, or to have us doubt what you have to say to us, Jesus. And so we just silence and bind and cast out the enemy of this place uh, that's in this place now in Jesus' name. Not today, devil. Do you guys agree? Yes. Amen. Amen. Are you ready? Okay, here it is. All three verses in one shot. Let's read together. Here it is. Paul says this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Those are the kind of words that we say. We say unity, all and all and one and all and great, one for all and all for one. Musketeers, here we go. Next verse, right? We read stuff like this and we don't really understand what Paul is saying, so I'm here to help you break it down. 
Are you ready? Here it is. Verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. What is Paul saying? First, unity takes effort. That's the first thing Paul is saying. Unity takes effort. Now, all of us are united through the Holy Spirit. The moment you say yes to Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. You are at peace with God. God is at peace with you. Do you know that? Can I tell you something? The way that you speak to yourself when you want your, you to change is often inherited by your family or determined by the emotional maturity of the people around you. And I'm going to say that 94% of the time, the words we speak to ourselves are full of shame and guilt and condemnation and anger and frustration and irritation. And what we do is then we assume that God speaks to us the same way. And to follow Jesus is to learn that God doesn't ever speak to you that way, that he loves you, that he's died for you to prove that, like he didn't die for you as your ransom to be irritated with you. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you. And to the journey of knowing Jesus is learning to speak to yourself with his tone and words and love and affection so that you now can speak to others the same way. You have the Holy Spirit with you. He is your counselor, your advocate. He's the lover of your soul. He adores you. And we are united in that. So then Paul says, well, let me say this. Jesus did that work so that we could have the Holy Spirit in us. We were separate from God and he made a way. He brought peace through his death on the cross so that you and I have peace with God. That's why Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. He's made the peace possible. Yes? So then Paul says, okay, since we all have the Holy Spirit, since Jesus, our Prince of Peace, has made peace between us and God, put in a little bit of effort, y'all. Like, at least try. Try. Right? So all of our little dividing walls that we put up between each other, oh, my culture is better, my preferences are better, my opinion is better, my theology is better, my sports team is better. They're meaningless compared to the reality that the creator of the universe who created and holds all things in his hand died for me. Who the heck cares what my sports team preference is or how right I think I am on Tuesday versus Wednesday? I don't need to be mean to you because of that. Right? At the end of your life, when you're sitting at home about to go to Jesus or in the hospital bed about to go to Jesus, you will never think, I wish I was more mean and irritable. I wish I just really harped on them more so they would change. Because that's always worked for me. No, we'll think how... In those moments, our greatest desire would be that we would have peace with our family members and our friends. So Paul says, make an effort. Look, if you are the one who thinks that you have to correct everybody's theology and behavior, sorry, you're trying to do the Holy Spirit's job. And you will become a burr in everybody's saddle. And they cannot wait for you to go to a different church. (laughs) So what does it look like to make every effort? Often making the effort to keep united with each other means that you're going to have to live in tension. You have to live with the tension 
You're going to have to give your time and your energy and your money for these relationships and for what God is doing here. And not everything is going to go your way. And that's tension. You get to love and to be loved, which is wonderful. And at the same time, it's also tension. This week I was working on my sermon and Joe, my friend, the Minister of Mass Information and Chaos Management and Herding Cats, <laughs> says to me, hey, Andy, I'm, you know, uh, I love you. God says I need to pray for you. I need to, I'm going to come visit you. I'm bringing you lunch. And I said, no, that's fine. I'm just, I'm writing my sermon. I'm good. Don't come. And he said, no, I'm coming. And I was like, no, that's, I know I can't do that. Now, two days before I had just, you know, said to Joe, look, you really need to stop isolating. And you, you know, and like, you got to tell us when you need something, because I love you and I'm, you're my friend. And like, if you're struggling with something, I want to know. And Joe's like, hey, hypocrite, um, you just told me this two days ago. And, and I was like, uh, uh, and you know, I'm sitting there writing on my sermon and I don't want to be around anybody and I don't want to share what's happening and I don't want anybody to come over and I just want to be in Mopey Martyrville, you know, and write my sermon so that, oh, you know, that's going to be a really good sermon. Well, poor me, right? And so what's happening when Joe's calling me out, right? It's tension. It's tension. But then Joe's like, hey, I'm going to bring a torta. So here, I didn't know this, but that's a torta, right? Evidently, um, our Latino brothers and sisters know how to make a sandwich that feeds all of Mexico. <laughs> like in one, it was five pounds, y'all. It was this thick. And he's like, here. And I'm like, Joe, that's like literally a pound of cheese on it. I didn't eat for three days after, <laughs> right? So Paul is saying, make every effort to keep unity. And I need you to know that, that that means that you are choosing tension. And tension's okay. In fact, it's really important. It's actually, tension is the thing that makes us move to where God wants us to go. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a guitar, right? Right? Okay. Okay. This is Zed's guitar. I love Zed's guitar. Zed, I won't mess up your guitar if you're watching. He's not even watching. It's fine. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> okay? So here's this string, right? This is the low E string on it, right? I'm watching, by the way. I love you, Zed. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine about it. It's fine about it. Okay? Now, okay, this on an instrument is called the headstock, Right? Now, if you and I are the strings and we want to be connected to the head of the church, which is Jesus, then we got to, we're united with Jesus. We wrap ourselves around him. We become connected to him. That's fantastic, right? Now, the string not connected to Jesus, is it going to make a sound if I play it? What does it have to be connected to? The body. And then it has to be brought into tension so that the string in correct tension is harmonious with every other string. And they can make a beautiful sound. Does that make sense? Then your life will become a melody that is worth playing and listening to. Does that make sense? Tension matters. Tension is important. In relationships, there's tension. And the tension is okay. And I know that you, it's easier to isolate because there's no tension. And I know it's easier to not give because there's no tension. And I know it's easier to not show up and say, I have a purpose and I'm going to serve because there's no tension. Netflix is literally no tension. All my body goes to sleep, right? But then I don't sleep because it's Netflix. Now when I want to sleep, I'm just awake, right? Does that make sense? Tension is actually good. Make every effort to keep the unity. Show up. Give your time, your money. Invest in what God is doing here. I don't know if you know this, but almost all of you are new. The beginning of the year, there was 250 left people in this church than there is now. We've grown by 250 people this year. We're on track. 
we're on track this year. You're on track this year between the two services and everybody online to get to the, that you will have donated over a million dollars this year for God's kingdom. There has been more baptisms, more salvations, more healings than ever before. We're making a difference in more people's lives. You literally single-handedly have made over a dozen families so that they now have furniture and they're not homeless. Amazing. What? That's our story. And it's because we've decided to be here in this place with tension that I'm going to show up and my matter and I'm significant. I was talking with Sandra Taylor, who was at their prayer retreat last week. She was a graduate of the one before. This time, she was sitting in um, uh, and praying for us, and she was actually connected, right? So she's sitting there praying all day long, and it's amazing what she's happening, uh, what was happening in Sandra's life. Sandra has spent the last two months with her friend in New Mexico, her friend Mel had diabetes. She had to get an operation. She had to get her leg amputated because of the diabetes. And so Sandra went to spend two months with her friend Mel. At the end of those two months, Mel actually died. And she was in agony after the amputation, and she didn't know what to do, and she was not sleeping, and she was moaning all night long. And Sandra said, I'll spend the entire night with you, Mel. And Mel is ag in moaning and crying in pain. And Sandra literally, she just said this every time Mel would be in pain. The blood of Jesus on, it, on this. All night long, for eight hours straight, Sandra prayed that prayer. And by the end of the, mor by the, end of the night, when dawn broke, Mel was at complete peace. She was at complete peace from then on, every day and every night until a week and a half later when she died. Wow. And when we were praying about it and talking about it and Sandra was weeping, she was saying, I don't know, I don't know what's happened with Mel. I don't know if she's a Christian. She resisted God every single step of the way. I said, Jesus, what happened? And Jesus said, Mel's with me. See, in the tension of showing up and praying and believing that her prayers mattered, Sandra made an enormous difference in Mel's life. And Mel, crying out in the middle of the night, kept on hearing that the blood of Jesus would cover that and take care of that. And she became, she in that moment had faith and started to trust Jesus. And then she had experienced peace that she never had in her entire life for the last week of her life, and now she's with God. Wow. Amen? Sandra made every effort to keep unity and bring peace. I need you to know that your efforts matter, that you have significance, and you are remarkable. And we let go and trust God with the outcomes, but you, your efforts matter. Amen? Amen? So then Paul writes, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Okay, what in the world is Paul saying? Well, there's one church, that's the body of Christ, that's us. There's one spirit that we all share, that's the Holy Spirit. And there's one hope, pretty straightforward, yeah? But what does this mean? Now, when I first wrote this, I got it all wrong. I thought that if I make every effort to maintain peace and unity in my home and relationships, then hope will come. And then I was talking with Debbie about it, and I said, what do you think? I'm writing this. And she goes, Andy, um, that stinks. You're making hope cheap when you write it like that. And I thought, you're right. I am. Because if hope is the result of my efforts, then if I'm experiencing hopelessness, then I'll have to think, I just need to work harder. And that's not hope at all. Let me explain what I think Paul's getting in. I think much better than my first self-centered reading. First, there's one body, that's the church, which means, number one, being a lone ranger is off the table. So congratulations, you did it. You're not isolating this morning. If you're watching online or if you're here, congratulations, way to go. Yeah? Awesome. Okay. Um, second, there's no other option that exists. 
if there's one church, it's not like, well, there's two churches, so choose. No, it's there's one church, okay? There's one that, so that's, that, that means that we need you, and that means that you need us. We want you. I don't know if you know this, but your gifts, the gifts that God, the Holy Spirit, has given you in your talent, in your intellect, and then also the spiritual gifts that he's given you, we desperately need. Did you know that? You know that you're not called here by accident? You're actually called because the gifts that you have are remarkable and needed. And we want you to use them. And we are literally your staff. You have staff. Your staff is to here to help make a way so that you get to use your gifts. That's how it works. Second, there's only one spirit, which means I don't have to do the saving. And I have teenagers, and they're pagans, even though they say they love Jesus. I don't believe it. And, and, and I, I think, oh, it's my job to fix them, and it's not. It's the Holy Spirit's job. And I get to say, I get to pray for them, I get to discipline, I get to bring order out of the chaos. But ultimately, from now until forever, like, I, can you imagine if I tried to save and fix all of you? Like, I would come up here just, like, just destroyed every week, angry and irritated and frustrated and, like, listen, man, you got to, like, let's work harder, bro. Like, come on, you know. Like, there would be no joy in me. But that's what it means to have one spirit is that I get to trust. That the God who made everything out of nothing, who brought the dead to life in my heart, can also do it in yours. So we're united, we're one because of Jesus. So then why is hope so prominent in this verse? Why does Paul include hope? Because hope is the most powerful gift, one of the most powerful gifts Jesus gives us. Hope is the assurance, the certainty that God will make a way forward for our good no matter what we face. Why is hope so important? Because it's the foundation for our faith. Faith is action. Hope is the reason why we would even act in the first place. Does that make sense? Faith is putting your car in drive. Hope is gas in the tank. Does that make sense? Faith, we, 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 faith is an action. It's a, it's a heart thing, but it's an action. We, we, put, we put to practice the belief that it, because hope is real and God will make a way for our good, then I can pray, then I can serve, then I can love, then I can forgive because God will make a way where there is no way. That's hope. Does that make sense? What hope is? Right? So why make every effort towards unity? Why follow the Holy Spirit and not the whims of my own spirit? Hope. God will make a way. And for years, I have lived with hopelessness. My son's brain and life destroyed by a stroke and a seizure, in unstoppable seizures. What's the point of even praying anymore? It's not going to fix his disabilities. My wife and I stuck in endless cycles of dysfunction. It's like, what's the point of trying for the 301st time if the 300 times didn't work? Been alone in ministry for a long time. Not anymore, but Kali, there was times when I thought to myself, what's the point of even trying anymore? Like, I'll just, why don't I just go to work at Home Depot? I'll just go be a cop, you know? At least I could shoot somebody, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sorry, real talk, you know? I prayed through that murder, though. I'm good. I'm not kidding. 
You know, do you ever feel that way? Where you're just like, I don't know. I don't think it's going to change. Like, I just don't. And listen, y'all, like, maybe it won't. Maybe it won't change till heaven for them, for you. Maybe it won't. But maybe it could. And I'd rather live out of that horrible chasm, that dark, hopeless chasm. I'd, I'd rather not live there. Because living there is painful. It's just dead. You're just like, well, you know, just don't have any expectations because nothing's going to change. And what I found at the bottom of that pit of hopelessness, in the middle of all that darkness, that's where Jesus was. What? Like, that's the power of the gospel. Hope would be so cheap if I had to get myself up out of the chasm, but that's not the good news. The good news is that Jesus met me there. And he meets me there. And he pulls me out and heals my heart. He's my everything. He is my hope. Can't even see the notes. <laughs> and I need, here's the thing, too, is that like when God pulls you out of the hopelessness and he says, here's this, here's hope, here's something good, you've prayed for this, and then here it is, then what do we do? Sometimes what we do is we say, yes, thank you, Lord, and we praise God and things are good, and the other times we go, no. No, I, that's too much. We say, God changed my life, and he says, okay, you ready? Quit your job and move, and we're like, not that much. You know, it would be like we're driving our 1991 Toyota Corolla and like here's a brand new gorgeous car that, and we're like, oh, I have to get out of my Corolla but I know the seats and all the stains. Like just because the street names in hell are familiar doesn't mean you have to live there. And so we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Well, I don't know if I risk, you know, if it's like, well, God has given me this new thing and... and just because, oh, Andy, I'm going to heal your life and I'm going to restore things and change things and I'm going to bring healing to your heart doesn't mean that everything looks the way that I want it to look. People got free will. Bad stuff happens. Death, destruction, brain injuries. Like, life happens. I don't know if you know this, but nobody makes it out alive. And so we don't want the tension that comes with faith, with connection with each other. We think, oh, if God is going to change my life, then all of a sudden it'll, it should be perfect. And that's not how it works. God saves you from your hopelessness and will set your feet upon a rock. That's Jesus. And he will give you a new hope and a new heart and a new life and a new purpose. And it might look different than it did before you fell into the chasm. And I dare I say, it probably always will. So this, this last week, I got to hang out with Lauren. Lauren is new to our church. She's not here this morning because she is a farrier. And uh, do you know what a farrier is? That's a blacksmith that puts horseshoes on horses. And so Lauren is a little bit younger than I am. She's got an amazing little daughter, a uh, seven-year-old daughter named Eva. And, and this is her third time coming to church uh, last week. And uh, Lauren, um, uh, Lauren comes with her friends, John and Madeline. John is also a farrier. Um, they drive from San Inez. So don't complain about how long it takes to come to church. <laughs> They, they drive from San Inez, which is 40, which is, if you're watching online, that's six hours away. Um, so, so it's 45 minutes. Uh, so Lauren was nine months pregnant being a farrier and needed a little bit of help because the last two weeks were difficult for her. 
So John the farrier who comes to our church helped her out. And then John Madeline invited her to church. And Lauren's never been to church a day in her life. Doesn't know God. And so we were having lunch last week, and she told me the story about how she was taking the trash out to her long driveway, and she, was, she dictates notes on her phone because she doesn't have time to type with two hands because she's feeding her five cows and her 60 chickens and taking out the trash. Literally, her cows are giving birth this morning. That's why she's not here. I mean, I didn't even take a shower. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm tired, you know? And she's like up at three helping deliver calves. Incredible. <laughs> so she's pulling, pulling the trash can down, d- down the driveway, and she's dictating into her phone, well, I guess I went, you know, third time coming to church. No, sorry, second time coming to church. And so I'm guessing I'm exploring this thing called faith. And she looks down at her phone, and it, her phone had auto-corrected the word faith to something that she'd never even seen before. And so she was like, that's weird. So she, so she deleted it, and then she said faith, and then her phone auto-corrected back again to a word that she'd never heard before. And then she hand-deleted it and then typed faith in, and her phone auto-corrected the word faith to this word. Wow. Ishmael. She's like, what the heck does this mean? And so she looked it up, and you know what Ishmael means? Next slide. God hears me. And she fell onto her knees at the end of the driveway and looked up in heaven. I was like, wait a minute. All, All the prayers of my hopelessness, all the prayers of my heartache, you've been here? And she could feel Jesus' presence, and she... Gave her life to Jesus last week over Thai food. Why? Next verse. Because there's one Lord. And there's one faith. And we have one story. We've been dead and now we've come up out of the waters of death into life. There's one God and one Father, and he is working in every part of your life and through every part of your life, and he is over every part of your life. And there is hope for you. Please understand, I'm not saying that just because there's hope, bad things will never happen again. We live in a broken world. All of our politicians are dead, but they're just animated somehow good lord I make horrible choices all the time and I have to live with the consequences other people make horrible choices all the time that impacts my life and I have to accept those consequences the entire world is very aware of all the pain and all the chaos that's what's normal The chasm of hopelessness is normal. That's everybody's life out there. You and I have a story. You and I have a hope. And his name is Jesus. And you are living. You are the light shining on the hill right now. Where you come, be say, come check out my church. Come let me tell you a story of how I was dead and now I'm alive. Listen, friend, I was so foolish. I was a knucklehead in every area of my life. And then God, by his mercy, saved me for a life of love and hope and joy. That's our story. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the food being prepared for us that's calorie-free outside. God, thank you we can pray this into our bones across the street at Table Talk where there's food and coffee. Thank you, Jesus, for the friends sitting next to us, the loved ones sitting next to us who have picked us up when we've been stuck in that miry pit. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving my heart hope again. Thank you, Jesus, for this life that you have for me. I love you, Lord. And I just pray a profound blessing on each one of my friends today. 
honor them and bless them and I pray against any stupid plan the enemy has to rob or what, whatever. Yeah. Nah, not today, yeah. devil. Bless my friends, their children, their grandchildren, their marriages, their businesses, their finances. Pour out your blessing upon them, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Would you stand for the benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance. That's his delight in you and give you the peace and the hope that passes all understanding. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. you guys, if you want prayer, you can come forward. We will pray for you. Otherwise, have an amazing day. Pastor Andy Rock is the senior pastor of Coastal Community Church. It's located in Grover Beach, California and serves communities across the Central Coast. Join us online each week on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our weekly live stream. We also have two in-person services at 9 a.m. and 1040 a.m. in our sanctuary. Coastal Community Church is located at 1830 Farrell Road, Grover Beach, California. For more information, visit our website www.mycoastal.org. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.